All right, guys, the main objective for today is to get the exhaust work started on the Jeep Cherokee XJ project that we're doing an LS swap on. My name's LT, and this is a 1998 Jeep Cherokee XJ. It's a two-door sport model. It's got Dana 60s, which are one-ton axles, 17-inch beadlock wheels, obviously both front and rear. Uh, it's got some body armor on it. It's riding on a Rusty's long arm suspension kit. Some of you guys have actually brought up in the comments about this thing needing a unibody reinforcement. Luckily, it's already been done, actually. You can kind of see on there, uh, the whole frame rails front to back have this really heavy duty steel, it looks like maybe quarter inch, just kind of bolted slash welded in there. So this should be a rock solid foundation for the power plant that's gonna be in here, or which is in here. Uh, six liter LQ4 with a cam in it is gonna be putting out probably double the horsepower of the four liter straight six that was in there. So today's objective, start on the exhaust. The headers for this project are made by Novak. That's the same company that made the motor mount conversion. So they're a direct bolt in and everything clears nicely. So now we just need the materials for the rest of the exhaust. And this is just kind of an overview of everything that we're gonna be working with today. The bulk of the materials are right here. These are two builder's kits that I picked up from Amazon. There's a two and a half and a three because we're going two and a half inch head pipes, three inch tailpipe. And this is, believe it or not, the same material that I used to construct the crossover pipe on my Turbo 8.1. It's a pretty good alloy. I think it's 409, um, but it, it welds a whole lot cleaner and better than some of the other builder's kits that I've used in the past. Um, it does produce some nice shiny colors and it's a, a, I think, more pure alloy. So it just looks a whole lot better when you weld it. It's a lot easier to get some cool colors from it. And I know, you know, you guys who are like actual pipe welders in the sanitary food world or nuclear or whatever you weld, I know you're not supposed to have colors on there in the welds, but it does kind of look cool. And in motorsports, obviously, there's really no like rule book when it comes to weld inspection. So uh, I like that it makes pretty colors. Also, it's inexpensive. It does come from Amazon and I will put the links down below in the description for these builders kits. Um, you get two of everything in each size. So you get two 180s, two 45s, two 90s, and two straight sections. And obviously we have two kits, two and a half and three. The muffler, this is a Magnaflow stainless muffler. Pretty simple, 24 inch long body, three inch straight in and out. Y pipes, I've got two of them. This one over here is from Amazon. This is the one I told the customer to order. Uh, and this one I ordered after the fact. The reason why I have two here is because this one is about seven and a half inches wide, which if you had a big truck is not a huge deal, but the frame rail over here and the transmission pan over here, I've got about seven and a half inches, which I could make this work, but it's gonna be a little bit tight. Now this is a Flowmaster Y-pipe I bought kind of as a backup. And this is the same one that I used on the F-150 exhaust that I finished up a little while ago. And kind of in the tightest spot underneath the truck, right here, this one's about five inches. So roughly I gained two inches of clearance in this spot. And yeah, it does get a little bit wider up here, but where this is gonna go underneath the Jeep, the trans pan is gonna start like right here. So this does buy me a whole lot more room. And yes, the Y-pipe is a little bit longer. It's in total, let's see, it's about 16 and a half inches long, but the last six inches here, this is just straight. So if you had to, you just chop that off there and you know shorten it by six inches. Lastly, we've got a high flow catalytic converter. This is also just an Amazon item, I believe. Uh, these don't take away a whole lot of sound. That's why we kind of have a little bit bigger muffler just to keep this thing, you know, civilized, because when you're out on the trail, you obviously want to be able to hear your spotter or, you know, whatever's going on. You want to be able to hear it, like trees crunching or rocks or whatever's going on. I don't off-road a whole lot. I guess that's pretty obvious. But one thing I do know is whenever you're designing an exhaust for a vehicle that is going to go off-road, you obviously want to keep your clearances as tight as possible to the bottom of the vehicle. So whenever this is done, I don't wanna see any or very little parts of the exhaust sticking down below here. Now, obviously you don't wanna to basically touch the floorboard. You wanna have a little bit of room for movement, number one. And number two, you don't want the heat to be radiating directly into the cabin of the vehicle. So we'll just keep things up as high as possible. The biggest challenge on this particular setup is gonna be on the front driver's side branch of the exhaust because you get a lot of moving parts in there and an off-road vehicle like this. The suspension is going to be cycling quite a bit. So we'll start on that side and see if we can keep it away from the drive shaft.
So I've just been trying to get a lot of work done. I haven't done a whole lot of filming, but I do have the driver's side portion of the front half of the exhaust 100% complete. It's tacked together. It's not finished welded, but the positioning is pretty much permanent. Now the next challenge is, is going to be a little bit tricky, but I've got to connect from the passenger side header down into the Y pipe. And there's a couple of twists and turns that I'm going to have to make in a fairly short distance, but hey, that's what the job is. And we're going to knock it out of the park. So this is kind of what it looks like so far. First thing you'll notice is I did elect to run the Flowmaster Y pipe. And there's just so little space in between the transmission pan here and the frame rail here that this narrower pipe is definitely going to make things a lot easier. It's almost impossible to use the other one. Uh, this branch right here where it came out on the wider Y pipe, it kind of almost sat over a little lip in the frame rail that was out here. So uh, this is a narrower Y pipe and it also is a little bit better flowing. So it's a win-win. You'll notice that the uh, exhaust is sitting kind of flat on the table. This is more or less how it's going to sit up underneath the Jeep. And the flange right off the header does kick in at a pretty harsh angle. The reason for that is normally there's an upper four link arm that sits right through here. Obviously the suspension will cycle up and down and you don't want it to hit the collector here. So that's why they have that harsh angle. Also, I did have a little kick here for the oil filter. The oil filter will sit kind of down there like that. So you've got plenty of room to change the oil. And then the pipe stays very, very close to the transmission bell housing because out here you've got a drive shaft and also you don't want the drive shaft to hit the exhaust. So that's kind of the shape that it's going to take on the passenger side. It'll be a pretty simple jog in slightly, jog up, and then another final twist to get into the header. The very first thing that you'll notice I did is I cut the flange off the little stub tube that came with the headers. And this kind of drives me nuts. I hate how this has to, how they sent this out, but number one, it's mild steel, not a huge deal. But number two, it reduces from a two and a half inch three bolt collector down to two and a quarter inch exhaust pipe. And then obviously it's mild steel. So I didn't like either of those. It wouldn't make any sense to go from two and a half to two and a quarter and then to reduce back up to two and a half. So we just chopped that thing off and we'll weld the two and a half stainless directly to this flange. And because we are going stainless to mild steel, we'll just have to use some 309 filler, I believe. Um, anyway. When you're working with three bolt flanges, which I hate doing, you want to make sure you manage your heat input. You can kind of see already these were warped and after they finish welding them, they just kind of surface them. That's what those little sanding marks there are for. And if they do warp a little bit more, I'll just take some sticky back sandpaper, put it on my table because this welding table is really, really flat. And they just kind of come along here and, you know, sand it smooth again, make sure everything is flat so we don't have any leaks. For the most part, that's the process. I didn't really show you actually building the stuff underneath the truck, but the only thing I will say, make sure you make your cuts square to the center line of the bend. Other than that, when I build this, it's just one pipe at a time. I'll have one tack welded to the rest of the exhaust. The next pipe I'll come in here, just kind of twist it so I get the bend exactly where I need it to be. Once I'm happy with it, make a single mark right across the seam, bring everything out and weld it on the table. I really don't like welding underneath a vehicle when I'm doing stuff like this, especially with the TIG welder. Really the only instance where I'll use the TIG underneath the truck is when I'm say joining the Y pipe and the two headers, everything all together at once because there's so much that you have to have precisely lined up. But usually I'll just take everything welded on the bench. So let's get back to work.
So through the magic of making videos just a few minutes later, I have the passenger side pipe completely done, is finish welded. So now I have two finish welded front sections in the Y pipe, and I just need to join them together underneath the truck with everything bolted in place so it's exactly where it needs to be. Then I'll bring the whole front section of the exhaust out from underneath the truck, put it on the bench, and finish weld it in one easy go. But I kind of wanted to take some time to talk about welding, the TIG welder, how I have it set up, and some things that I'm trying different on this exhaust system that I normally don't do. So I'm gonna break up this exhaust build into two separate videos. This one is gonna focus mostly on the welding tech, and the next one I think I'm gonna focus on the actual process of how I'm gonna construct an exhaust system to fit you know, around things like axles, shocks, the tailpipe, and just my process of building. So anyway, uh, today we're talking welding, and I have the two samples right here. The first one, this is obviously the pipe that's actually going underneath the Jeep, and this one I just welded two scraps together. And the main difference between these two, which now that I'm looking at it, it doesn't actually look a whole lot different, but the main difference is this pipe I built using the pulse settings on, and this one I had no pulse at all, just straight current. So first of all, what the heck is pulse, and why is it important for welding stainless steel? So it's pretty simple. Uh, stainless steel suffers from something called carbide precipitation and a few other things that happen when you heat it up, which is basically where the chromium that's inside stainless steel, that's one of the elements that actually make it not want to rust. Uh, but anyway, whenever you heat it up, like for welding, the chromium actually wants to kind of escape and get out of the metal and that can lead to some problems, mostly with strength and things like that. It can lead to porosity, especially on the backside if you haven't back purged your weld. Uh, so anyway, the short version is stainless steel is especially critical of how much heat you put into it while you're welding. Now mild steel is too, but stainless steel is just super tricky. And I'm not gonna tell you that I'm an expert and I have everything figured out, but I'm just trying to use some settings that are built into this welder. It is an inverter based welder that kind of can help you manage how much heat you actually pump into that metal while you're welding. Of course, you have things to keep in mind like how long you're sitting in one spot, your travel speed, but today I'm strictly talking about welder settings. So pulse. Basically, a lot of welders, like I said, and mostly inverter welders, have the ability to vary automatically how often and how long the main current is on. So when you're just normally welding, your foot pedal's like a throttle, and if you kind of picture the wave or of the current, whenever you're at full throttle, you're at your maximum current of, say, 65, 75 amps, or however much you've selected on the machine, and it's going to stay there until you take your foot off the pedal. But when you're using a pulse setting, basically what the machine is doing, it kind of takes over. Your foot still has control of the main current, but um, the machine will automatically pull away current in sort of like a square wave fashion. So it goes high current, low current, high current, low current. And then you can control how many times that happens per second, and you can control the maximum current, the duration of the maximum current, and you can also control the base current. So let me show you real quick on this particular welder what I set up to get these results here. So every machine is gonna set up just a little bit differently, but on this machine, I'll kind of walk you through the steps. The first thing I'll note is uh, main current right here. So 65 amps of main current. That is a little bit more than you necessarily need for this thinner stainless steel. Uh, I didn't measure it, but this stuff I've been running on straight current, somewhere around like 52 to 55 amps. That's more than enough. But when you are using the pulse settings, because it's pulsing up and down, you do need to run just a little bit more current. So on the pulse setup, I ran 65 amps. Uh, six seconds of post flow, that's not necessarily important for this discussion. I do run a half a second of pre-flow to just kind of purge the area around the weld before I start. Uh, this is the pulse setting. So we have 25 amps of base current. So it goes from 65 amps max to 25 amps base. 25, uh, 30, this is 30 pulses or cycles per second. So for every second, it's going 30 times from 65 to 25 amps. Uh, boom, 30, and then finally we have percent on time. So that's 35% of the time it's at its maximum current and the rest of the time it's down below. So more or less what's going on, kind of like I mentioned a bit ago, the machine is going from maximum current to the minimum current that you set. You can control how long it's on, all in an effort to basically control how much heat you're pumping into this part. Now, just kind of a cool side note, if you're just learning to TIG weld, um, I've actually used the pulse feature. If you can dial it way down to like say half a pulse a second, um, you can use that to kind of control and help time your dabs as you add the filler in. 
Um, anyway, so I welded one part on the table here with the pulse settings like I just outlined, and the other one I just welded with straight current 55 amps. And it's kind of hard to tell a difference. So in theory, this is all great. Um, the one thing I will say is the, the gold color, kind of like through here, this is more what you're going for. The light blues, the purples, usually it gets kind of darker as it has more heat. And so this one here, I will say, I think it has a little bit more of kind of the purple stuff in it. Um, it does have some gold, but usually the gold areas, that's where like you stop and the post flow runs in this one second as the weld is cooling off. And kind of these blues and purples, that happens while you're just welding and you're traveling and it stays warm as the TIG torch kind of goes away out of the argon. So this, the shielded spot, this is probably one of the better looking welds of the whole setup. I'd say there's probably a little bit less purple, a little more on the light blue side. Certainly, I think there's a little bit more of the gold looking stuff in this weld with the pulse. Um, all that being said, though, it is kind of hard to tell just visually which one is better. The other thing you can kind of compare is the heat affected zone. That's this wide area. Kind of see the blue slash brown line there to there. In theory, I think you're going to have a smaller heat affected zone. So maybe depending on which spots you compare here, you'll have a little bit less of that HAZ heat affected zone. So anyway, uh, the other thing I will mention about welding this together is there's two different types of filler that I've been using. When I'm joining stainless steel to stainless steel, I'm using 308. And then when I'm joining stainless steel to mild steel, like on this flange here, I'm using 309. It's a little bit different alloy of filler and it's intended for joining dissimilar metals, kind of like that, but it also still has all the stainless steel stuff. So the welds should not rust. So that's a lot to digest, a lot of information there. Um, I would still can do a few more things on top of what I've done on this system to kind of help improve the quality of weld. You know, back purging is one thing that's important. I always back purge whenever I'm building something that's like, say, before a turbocharger. Uh, on stuff like a regular exhaust, I usually don't back purge, but the back purge definitely would help uh, how much heat is in the part because that will shield it on the backside. And number two, that gas flow kind of helps cool it down a little bit. Also a larger cup, like over here somewhere, I have a number 16 cup. I usually don't, it's in a box. I usually don't use the number 16 cup because it does require a lot more gas flow. Right now I'm running a number 12. I'm gonna open this here for you. I am running a number 12 on the end of the torch. Let's see, monster number 12 is what I normally run kind of for everyday welding. And this is a number 16, so it is quite a bit larger. Oh, that's my hand. It is quite a bit larger, but you've got to crank up the gas flow on this bad boy. And it might be worth a comparison just to see, you know, what this would look like with a 16 cup, because I bet it would look a lot better than that. Uh, but I am going to have to run, right now I'm at 25, let's see, that's liters per minute uh, CFH. 25 CFH of argon, I'd probably crank that up to 30 or so with the bigger cup, just to make sure you have enough gas flow to fill up the cup or the lens, whatever you want to call it. So I'm rambling at this point, but that's kind of the welding information that I wanted to share. Uh, now all I got to do basically is get this stuff back up underneath the truck, weld the two halves together, and the system should be done. So this is more or less your last chance to make sure everything fits. So just double check clearance around things like, you know, the floor pan and the cross member because we're on a three inch exhaust from the Y pipe back. There's not a lot of room to make everything kind of fit together. So like I said, now that we've got this one last connection, it's the last shot. So I just got everything where I want it. Now we're gonna tack weld this, take it out and finish welding on the bench.
So now is the moment of truth because I have this whole system welded together in one big giant piece now. And if you notice, there's a lot of obstacles and a lot of weird angles to this part of the exhaust. So I hope I can get it out in one piece because if not, no, I'm not going to be happy. Just put it that way. So everything is finished welded, the Y-pipe is 100% complete and ready to go back up underneath the Jeep. Now I'm not going to install it right at this moment because I do need to install the trans cooler lines first before this goes permanently back in its home, but I am going to just kind of temporarily install it so you guys can see what it looks like up underneath the Jeep and how it clears everything, how we've got plenty of ground clearance. And also I just kind of like the fact that this material that we used, it's a lot shinier than some of the other stuff. And you could actually polish this if you wanted to. It comes sort of kind of polished, but you know, working with it, cutting it and having it in the vise does kind of dull it up a little bit. But uh, anyway, that's what the finished Y-pipe looks like for LS swapping an XJ Cherokee with a Rusty's long arm suspension kit. I did install one stainless steel O2 bung on the driver's side pipe. The reason I didn't install two is mainly because the Holly computer only uses one wide band for the oxygen sensor, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but if this weren't like a stock GM computer, I just have to add a second O2 sensor on there. That way you have bank one and bank two both reading independently before the wide pipe. One last thing I may have to do, I might have to put my flange, my V-band flange right here instead of after the cat. Normally I like to weld the catalytic converter to the mid pipe and have a flange directly after that, but because of how difficult this piece is to get in and out, you know, being as long as it is, I just might have to put the connection there. Not a big deal, it'll function pretty much the same way, but uh, this is one more last little thing I'm gonna have to do. Lastly, I did double check the flatness of these flanges here. One thing that I've learned, an easy trick, just take like a red Sharpie or something like that. Come along, just make a nice little red circle around here. I have one of these nice flat aluminum sanding blocks. Just kind of come along, sand it off. And as long as you have a nice shiny ring evenly around the outside, well, that'll tell you that the flanges are flat and hopefully they will seal up. These were kind of warped. That's another reason why I really hate working with three bolt flanges, especially considering this one is like quarter of an inch thick. So uh, if I had it my way, I would have put a V-band on the header before I started this whole job, but the headers are mild steel too. So it's kind of like that snowball effect of where do you stop? Anyway, that's going to do it for this week's upload. Next time, I think I'll start on the trans cooler lines just so I can permanently install the exhaust and I'll build the tailpipe. I'll do the, the next video a little bit differently. I'll kind of show you my process of building an exhaust step by step. We'll get some hangers on the tailpipe. We'll keep everything tucked away from the suspension, the fuel tank and all that good stuff. Um, you can expect that video, who knows, another couple of days, maybe next week. I don't know. It's a lot of work to make these videos. So I do appreciate you guys watching. I honestly do. Um, do me a favor though, head on over to tolmanperformance.com, grab some merchandise if you like. You know, we've got baseball hats, we've got long sleeve hoodies, we've got uh, lightweight hoodies, which I really, really love. I've told you guys that a million times. Um, check out my Facebook page, Instagram, LT underscore Tolman. I just have some kind of behind the scenes content. I usually put up a couple of pictures before the upload goes live. 
Other than that, thank you guys for watching. I appreciate you, and I'll catch you in another couple days.